Well, hello and uh, everyone and welcome, welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jim Preen, Crisis Management Director at You Do Sentinel. And for those who don't know, we make crisis management and crisis communication software. And if you want to learn a little bit more about that, uh, then you can see there's the web link there um, just below my name on the slide that you're now, now looking at. Well, I'm delighted to say that you, as you can also see from the screen, that today's webinar is presented in conjunction with the BCI as part of their education month. Um, which they're calling Facing the Future Together. Now, uh, the BCI has over 8,000 members in more than 100 countries and is the world's leading resilience organization. Today, as you can see here, um, we're looking at how business continuity and crisis management are going to have to adapt to stay relevant. Uh, you know, basically at how the pandemic is forcing change on business continuity and on resilience as well. And we'll, we'll get to that in a moment. Um, but before we do, it's a, a bit of a tradition on, uh, on my webinars. Um, for those listening to post in the question box where you're listening from. So why don't you go ahead and do that now? Hopefully you can see the Q&A box there on your control panel. So let us know where you're listening from. Let us know the town, the city, um, uh, or the country, wherever you're from. Oh, we're getting a couple in already. Um, oh, excellent, this is great. Um, well, very, very fast on your fingers here. So we've mm -hmm. got Susan from South Africa. We've got Francois from London. We've got Jeff from Suffolk, Virginia in the USA. Uh, we've got Sarah from Virginia Beach. Newark, UK, not Newark, New Jersey, that's Juliana. We've got hello from Herefordshire, from Lisa um, and, and uh, Robin, um, spelled with a Y, from Herefordshire. And from the Philippines, goodness, who's, who is the furthest away? Maybe the Philippines are winning right now. That's Rico, Rico from the Philippines. Uh, Snellville in Georgia, USA. That's Dawn, Dawn listening from there. Uh, Florine from ho at home in London. Uh, Glasgow, Scotland, excellent. We got <laughs> Will, we got Bill from Glasgow. We got Birmingham. Ah, now that's going to be interesting to my guest. But you, Jonathan, you just have to wait a second here. That's Mark from Birmingham. Uh, we got Bidolf, uh, Bidolf Staffordshire. That's Richard. Uh, Sussex, Maria, Baal. Um, in Switzerland, that's Petra. Goodness, there's going to be too many for me to read out, read out here. We've got Colombo, Sri Lanka, Shakir. Uh, oh my, okay, I think we have a winner here. We've got Debbie from New Zealand, Dunedin in New Zealand. And I actually <laughs> know where Dunedin is because a friend of mine is a music teacher there. And that is a long, long way away. And we've got Philip, Philip from Chile, who's been on many of these, these webinars before. I'm sorry if I haven't had time to read out all the names because we've got an awful lot of people on this webinar. But as you can see, we really do have, um, it's a United Nations here on this webinar and all the better for that. So I'm, I'm really delighted about that. Um, so talking of questions, you now, you found the question box there. So what I want you to do as we go through is put any comments and questions in the question box. Um, I'm not going to reserve time at the end of the, of the webinar for a Q&A session. We like to take them as we go. Um, and I like these, these, these webinars to be as interactive as they possibly can be. I'm going to be seeking my guests' thoughts and opinions, but I also want to hear your thoughts and suggestions too. I want you to challenge us. And you know, there's many, many people are on the, on this web, over a hundred people on the on this webinar. And I know many of, the, of you will be crisis management and business continuity people who will have thoughts about you know the direction of travel for business continuity. Uh, you probably have as much knowledge as we do. So we want to hear your thoughts as well and to make it as interactive as possible. Obviously, I'm going to be asking my guests opinions and thoughts but I want to hear your thoughts and suggestions too and now talking of my guest um, he's here well I hope he's here and he's Jonathan Hemus. Jonathan can you hear me I can hear you perfectly Jim that's great it's always such a relief um, when <laughs> my guest is here uh, otherwise I know I'm gonna have to talk for now Jonathan <laughs> thank you so much for joining us today um, there's a little profile about Jonathan um, on the slide that you're looking at now but Jonathan why don't you go ahead and tell us tell our audience a bit about yourself please 
Yeah, so as it says here, I'm, I'm the Managing Director of Insignia. We're a specialist crisis management consultancy, and what we do with our clients is to help leaders of businesses to do and say the right things on the worst days of their lives, and that's through crisis management planning, training, and exercising. And I guess what I'm driven by and what Insignia is driven by is helping to avoid the unnecessary damage and harm that's caused by a mishandled crisis, both to the organization itself, whether it's reputation or value, but equally, if not more importantly, the damage that's done to its stakeholders, whether it's people losing their jobs, people losing their homes, and of course, in the worst possible circumstances, people losing losing their lives. So. Uh, that's who I am. That's what we do. Been doing it for over 25 years now, and I'm as passionate passionate about it today as I was those 25 years ago. Fantastic, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Um, just a, just a further question for you, as this is part of um, the BCI's training month. Can you just give us a little insight as to how you got into crisis management and business continuity, yeah. and also maybe a couple of tips for those who are just starting out who, or who actually just want to get into the business? Could you talk us through that a little bit, please? Yeah, absolutely. And I would imagine that most people, when they were at school didn't say uh, I'd like to get into crisis management or I'd like to get into into business continuity I'd be staggered but really fascinated if someone on this call actually did think that when they were uh, at right. school so I I imagine that most of us got into this area through maybe an unusual or unexpected route my, my route was if I go and I don't worry Jim it's not gonna be my whole life story but if I go back to um, <laughs> kind of childhood my mother was in public relations and an oh, uncle right. to whom I was very close was a, a a lecturer in business studies at Aston University and I was interested in both of those things I was interested in business and I was interested in communication um, and so when I left university having done a business studies degree I then began a kind of conventional corporate communications career working in-house with a PLC on annual results and such like, but developed a real interest in the crisis element of communication. And it kind of comes back as well to what I was saying about wanting to avoid this needless harm. I got kind of frustrated by seeing businesses harm themselves and wanted to be part of the uh, solution. So I guess the other thing that piqued my interest that my second or third PR consultancy I worked for, one of our clients was Comdisco, uh, which became SunGuard. And also one of our clients uh, was the Business Continuity Institute. I'm talking 15, 20 years ago now. And both of those things really stimulated my interest in this area. Therefore, for my next role, I sought out a role that was about crisis communication. And I was made head of crisis and issues management at a global PR consultancy. Loved that role for 10 years and then 12 years ago decided, I really want to specialize in that role. I don't want to do any conventional communication. I want to focus on crisis management and crisis, crisis communication. So my route through was from an early interest in communication and business exposure to that area through my work in PR consultancies and then a personal passion to try and help make a difference to avoid some of those uh, crises or certainly some of those uh, unfortunate responses to crises. So, so any any tips for those who want to get into the business? Is there a particular degree course or something that you need to that you should go on for this? What, what what's your thought on that? So my there I think my my view would be there are many routes into uh, into this area in this role. So I'll just give you my perspective, but I don't think by any means it's the only way. I do yeah, yeah. think developing and showing an interest in business itself is mm. really important. You know, business continuity, there is a clue in the name. <laughs> uh, yeah. Likewise, in crisis management, it is about preserving and protecting the organizations that get into a crisis situation. So I think being genuinely interested in business is a good starting point. I would get involved with the various places in which you can meet others who share similar interests, whether that's online in the various LinkedIn groups that are available, the webinars, the conferences, 
learn, engage, talk, and build relationships with people. Reach out to people if it really is something that you're keen to get involved in. Through my career, I've learned the value of relationships, and so uh, meeting up, connecting with people who operate in this area already, and asking questions. Um, I always think that's uh, really, really helpful. And knocking on doors, like any any profession, any job, if you really, really want to get into that area, it's about banging people's doors down. It's about demonstrating you're genuinely interested and uh, showing that you have the passion and enthusiasm for it. And that will carry you a long way, I believe. All right. Well, that's great, Jonathan. Thank you very much indeed for that. Okay, well, look, let, let's let's move on. But before I engage Jonathan in, in conversation, I want to launch a poll. Mm -hmm. um, there's going to be quite quite a few polls um, today. Hopefully, you guys can see this, and I want you to vote on it. And I'm I'm just asking you, are you working from home? And very quickly, once you've done this, you'll start to understand why I'm asking this question. So the poll is in progress now. Uh, please vote on it. Um, we're getting pretty high numbers here. Okay, this is good. So are you working from home or not? And as I say, I will explain to you why I'm asking you that question now. Last dibs on this vote. People, a lot of people have voted, which I'm very pleased to see. So I'm now going to... Um, uh, so Jonathan, I'm, before I launch the results, what yeah. do you reckon? Do you, what, what do you reckon the results I'm are? Going I'm, for, I'm going for 70% working from home. Uh huh. Uh huh. Okay. Here are the results. Oh, 88. Goodness. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's that's that's quite. You know, we've got quite a lot of people on here. That's pretty interesting, I must say. So the vast, vast majority um, are, are working from home. Now, the reason why I ask that is because here we go um, with um, my question for Jonathan. Which is, you know, whoopsie, um, oh dear, here we go, Jim. The technology is getting away from me as usual. Um, hopefully, yeah. So my question is, just to sort of get us into this topic, with people not working together in offices, does it make it harder to fight a crisis? Is home working potentially a problem for crisis management? What are your thoughts on that, Jonathan? So I guess my opening gambit would be to say not necessarily, um, right? because I believe there are pros and cons to what, what we might want to call the traditional way of working and working in a crisis and the way that we will have to work for the foreseeable future. And I think as with everything in crisis management, it's down to how effectively you plan train and rehearse your response and if i think to the back to the it's not that long ago but if i think back to the traditional ways of working and managing a crisis there were always downsides with that way of working as well i mean how often have we had all of the right people or even the vast majority of the right people actually in the same room at the same time when we are fighting a crisis it's really really rare and actually when you have a group of people physically in a room together uh, if you haven't planned trained and rehearsed really effectively there can often be i'm sure people will have experienced a lack of focus and discipline in the meeting room a lack of clarity around what the latest situation is and i think also something that i'm sure many of you have experienced i certainly have when i've been working with crisis teams is for those people that are joining remotely when maybe two thirds of the team is in the room and one third isn't particularly if they're in a different country it is very difficult to avoid a situation whereby those joining remotely are second class citizens yeah unless yeah. there's real discipline they often get the rough end of the deal and are not able to participate as fully and as actively as those who are in the in the room together so what's what's the fix what's the fix for that jonathan I, I totally agree so i mean i think the general fix for it is planning training rehearsing and uh, then imposing yeah. that discipline on the meeting because as you know jim and as you know all of the people on this call know working in a crisis is a very particular way of working and it demands purpose it dem demands structure it demands focus it demands discipline um and I guess, as I say, one of the reasons why I say it's not necessarily more difficult, actually, if everybody is joining remotely, 
you cannot possibly work effectively unless you have that discipline yeah. and purpose. It's so just, actually, just it might make it easier. Yeah, I mean, just keeping people up to speed with the current information, um, it, you know, is more difficult if people are joining remotely. I mean, I, I mean I, I'm a big believer in the crisis room of writing up, you know, writing up yeah. information on whiteboards and so forth. Obviously, that's, you know, you're going to have to use electronic whiteboards to do yeah. that to keep everybody up to speed. I mean, somebody once said to me that, that some people seem to think that um, uh, w w being involved in a crisis or trying to fix a crisis is business as usual but just done at twice the speed but I don't believe that's true and I, I absolutely that's think, true think, yeah I, I think you know you've you've got to train people to do this that's why you need roles like crisis coordinators you yeah. need scribes you need people who are documenting information as it comes in and you know weeding out the the, the wheat from the chaff and documenting all actions and decisions that are taking but that's all kind of basic kind of crisis management stuff I guess um, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I suppose. Go, go on, sorry, go on. No, sorry, I guess. So, I think what I would say is yeah. probably right now it will be harder to uh, manage a crisis with people working virtually and working from home offices because probably those new disciplines and ways of working effectively in that environment have not yet been fully yeah. embedded. And so, I think that is the challenge. The challenge is working out what those new ways of working are embedding them but then once they are followed yes there'll be glitches but we know there are glitches in in the traditional way of working i think there is the opportunity actually for it to be a very effective way of working because it will force that discipline and structure that isn't always there when there's a bit of a bun fight a bit of a free-for-all in the crisis management room when people are physically there yeah, I, I mean, I suppose really when it comes down to it, it's kind of connectivity, it's communication yeah. that is so important Inter between the people who are trying to fight the crisis, let Correct. alone all your your external communications and so forth. Correct. All right. So, you, you, so to sum up on this, you think it is potentially a problem, but the way through it is to train people to, to basically deal with it. And, you know, as we were talking about just before the call started, unfortunately, you know, COVID is probably going to be with us for some time. So this yeah. is the kind of training and so forth that people need to get embedded now because it, we're not going back to any kind of uh, normality or normality prior to uh, to uh, February of this year, anyway. Absolutely, All right. and, and this is Sorry, this on, is also me. this is also one of these situations, Jim, whereby you know engaging in crisis management training and exercising, you will derive broader benefits because we are all going to need to work more effectively, more purposefully with people working from home. If the way of working in a crisis can actually be transferred into the broader business as usual, that's going to enable organizations to be more effective in general as well. Fantastic, all right, thank you. Now I'm gonna launch my next poll um, and I'm gonna launch it right now. And hopefully you can see that. So the poll here is, and I'd like you all to vote on this, please. In the wake of COVID-19, will crisis plans have to change? Now there's two sides to this. I, I would think that they probably do, but a kind of strict business continuity view of this is that a continuity plan is a generic plan there to fight any particular kind of, uh, of crisis, whatever it may be. It should be up to that job, or at least it should be partially up to that job. But I'm asking the question anyway. So in the wake of COVID, will crisis plans have to change? Um, and we're getting a good, yeah, we've got, yeah, we're pretty much set. I'm actually going to, okay, last chance, folks, if you want to vote on this, because I'm going to close the poll. Very, people are very quick today. We've got obviously a very mm -hmm. intelligent audience today. They're very fast on their fingers here. So I'm going to close this poll. I'm going to share the results. And you can see there, well, there you go. Despite what I said about business continuity plans, once again, a big yes. Um, on 84% think that plans will have to change. So we're kind of getting to the meat of what we're talking about now. I'm gonna hide those. Is that pretty much what you expected, Jonathan? What, what's your thoughts on that, please? It's probably what I expected, but I guess it yeah. depends on um, what we define as change. And it also depends on the extent of that change, because I am actually, the first thing I'm gonna say is to, <clears throat> excuse me, reflect what you just mentioned, yeah. Jim. To my mind, a good crisis management plan 
is a good crisis management plan and a crisis right. management plan which was good six months ago is still going to be a good crisis management plan despite COVID and I think one of the uh, reasons that sometimes there's I don't know confusion about that is how people define a crisis management plan for me a crisis management plan sets out a framework it sets out a way of working in a crisis situation which as we've already touched on is purposeful and effective under extreme pressure and it provides checklists and resources which enables you to move more quickly and to make better decisions and you know what we saw during covid was even if the clients didn't have a pandemic plan if they had a good crisis management plan it served them really well in organizing yeah. themselves and responding to covid so where i would say plans need to change is not at all in the fundamentals and the principles of the plan where i think they will need to change is how you work in a crisis and by that i probably mean primarily what we've just been talking about in that you know it no longer needs to talk about or certainly no long no longer needs to talk just about meeting in, in 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 a room and the room being equipped with this that and the other it needs to reflect the fact that there will be virtual teams operating in a crisis and that will make that will demand different requirements of technology and people but the fundamentals of how you respond to a crisis and the steps and the principles i believe will will not change and i think almost the reverse what i'm very concerned about yeah. is that people um assume that future crises are going to be like covid and i think covid is a literally a unique crisis in many of its characteristics and i'm worried that organizations and leaders within organizations think that all future crises will will be like that and i'm also worried that organizations may move towards very scenario specific plans which i think can leave you um hobbled if the crisis that happens isn't one of the scenarios that you predicted okay fine is it we've got a few questions coming in thank you very much for this i i don't susan asked the question and i don't know if you know about this can you suggest an electronic whiteboard we've tried using teams but have not found it very effective is the one that you use i mean obviously i could sell the the uh, software that we make but i think that probably would not be the thing to do is there anything that you've used um jonathan that you found uh, you know successful so i am not the person with insignia to right. ask uh, ask that question but certainly i'd be happy to uh talk to colleagues who are more up on that side of it and provide their recommendations afterwards okay great fantastic um and uh, mark is saying i agree it's a way of working you know it's about capable so he sorry he says first of all crisis plans surely it's about capability i agree it's a way of working and he talks about checklists and so forth yeah i don't know about you jonathan i'm a big big fan of checklists um for, for crisis plan yeah Absolutely. okay good uh, i mean i think perhaps we haven't said or maybe it was on the slide there that you've developed many crisis plans business continuity plans right yeah yeah yeah, and, yeah absolutely yeah okay good um uh okay re so K karen is saying re whiteboards we used a one note file within teams very successfully i've not used teams because it's a bit of in competition with what we do so i don't know it but uh, there it is um okay fantastic so sorry so jonathan just to sum up do you think mm -hmm. Do you think plans are going to have to change? I mean, I assume things like playbooks. Playbooks are very popular these days. Yeah. I assume they will have to change. Yes, I, I think um, clearly it is absolutely essential. If it hasn't happened already, it needs to happen now that every organization does a proper review of its COVID response to date, works out what has worked really well, and what requires change or improvement and part of that will be enhancing changing tweaking plans again my broadly i can see you know maybe 20 25 percent of the content of plans changing but 75 80 percent staying the same and it absolutely will be to do yes with those 
um, steps within the playbook and the kind of technological ways of, of, of working together, but not, as I say, the core principles of the crisis management approach itself. Yeah. I mean, I suppose, absolutely. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I mean, I suppose one thing to say about all this, and I don't really want to get into the technical aspect of it, but it is really important that critical staff are now equipped to work remotely. Yeah, totally. And, they, they, you know, and you know, that is something new that companies. I mean, not just in a crisis situation, although obviously that's what we're talking about today, but to work effectively remotely. And there's you know, the large indications that people are working very effectively remotely, yeah. but they do, they do need the right kit and the right support to do that, I think. They do. And it or, also touches on that, that thing that, again, is part of our core discipline, scenario planning ahead of time. So as you're thinking about, you know, responding to a crisis, it's not just how would we manage this crisis in a perfect world? It, it's about thinking beforehand, how would we manage this crisis if we weren't able to access our offices? How would we be able to manage this crisis if three of the apparently critical people were unavailable? And it's thinking like that that enables some organizations to get to grips with things like COVID quicker than those who've assumed that everything will be a perfect world when the crisis happens. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Marie Law has just said that uh, we are also using Teams successfully. So some are and some aren't. So, you know, that might be a solution for some people. Um, I'm going to move on, Jonathan, um, to sort of your kind of sweet spot in a way. I'm going to launch a poll here for people. Um, mm -hmm. Has the appetite, have you found that the appetite for training and simulations has diminished or has been somewhat interrupted shall we say during um during lockdown um okay people are voting now we're a bit more of a split vote on this uh, so jonathan what's i'm going to put you on the spot again what do you think do you think people are going to find this is the case or not i'm going to say 40 percent yes yeah, okay all right well you'll you'll see where you are all right folks i think yeah, we're almost there. Anybody else want to vote on this? Everybody's voting very, very quickly. I'm going to, to close the poll now. So has the appetite for, um, uh, here we go. Yeah, has the appetite for training and simulations diminished? And half say, yes, it has. Mm -hmm. uh, and 35% say, no, this is part of your business, Jonathan. What's your, what's your take on it? So clearly and very unsurprisingly, over the last six months depending on what part of the world you're in the appetite for crisis training and simulations between the beginning of this year and kind of july august uh diminished dramatically and clearly there <laughs> yeah. is zero surprise in that because yeah. well for, for, for really obvious reasons people yeah. are dealing yeah. with a live crisis and there clearly is no appetite for um, training and simulations whilst you're dealing with a, a live crisis. Um, that is now changing. Um, right, so right. Um, we are now uh, running training and exercises again have been, I think the first one was towards the end of June um, and that is increasing uh, during July, August and now into September. Are we running as many as we were running in February? No. People are still dealing with the current situation, but it is definitively increasing. And I think there are three areas in which it is uh, increasing. One is that <laughs> what I, of course, would describe as the really enlightened organizations are returning to the training and exercising that they previously planned on the basis that um, the risks that we were um, preparing for before still exist as well as COVID, so we can't afford not to train and rehearse for the risks that still exist. There's a group of organizations which are rehearsing what we were just talking about, how we would respond to a crisis when everyone's working from home. So, you know, we're specifically working with organizations that have commissioned exercises because they want to be confident that they can deploy a crisis response in the uh, new just world. Just out yeah. of sorry to interrupt, Jonathan. Just out of interest, what, what scenarios are they picking now? What 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 what, what sort of aspects are, are they looking so, at? What scenarios? And I know we're probably going to 
well, I know we're going to touch on this later, but you yeah. know, cyber is still one of the yeah. uh, key areas yeah, that yeah, people yeah. are rehearsing yeah. against. Um, right. And do you want me to expand on that here? Or yeah, yeah, please to... do. Yes, please. Yeah, so um, clearly cyber risks were very much front of mind before COVID. As all of the people on this call will know, actually, the risk of a cyber attack now is higher than it was before COVID because with people working from home, there are technical vulnerabilities and there are also human vulnerabilities, which mean that um, there is a greater risk. And there are all these um, uh, nasty cyber criminals who know that people are working from home, who know that people are looking out for emails from the World Health Organization and from their banks or financial services providers and have increased their phishing attacks. So as a consequence, the risk of a cyber incident is at least as high, if not higher than before. Therefore, uh, a number of our clients are pushing ahead with their cyber exercising and in fact, in some cases, accelerating it because they are viewing the risk as being higher. Yeah, I mean, because some people are obviously using their own IT equipment, computers Correct. and so forth at home. And who Correct. knows how um, effective the the security is and so forth if they're using their own equipment. It's not, you know, it's not going to be the same as being in an office where, they, you know, you, you may have a lot more protection in an office, firewalls and so forth, which you're just not um, going to have at home when you're using absolutely. a domestic router or whatever. So, yeah, and, and, I think... And, 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 and anecdotally, on, on. anecdotally, we're also hearing that um, because people are at home, they are less willing to put their hand up when something has gone wrong, when they know they've clicked oh, on something. Okay. And, clicked on. and I think whether there's almost a, a subconscious view that I'm distant from the office here and they won't find out, or, <laughs> you know, I, there's just yeah. seems to be something going on whereby there is less flagging up of issues with home working, or perhaps, you know, someone's son or daughter that's clicked on something on the so it just seems that like anecdotally i'm talking to you know, a number of cyber security uh, agencies who are saying they right. they are seeing seeing that happening yeah no that's very interesting um just got a comment from steve here oh mohammed yes i know i was still showing the poll i apologize for that it's it's now mm. time to stop showing the poll um steve said with regards to training and, and exercising we found an increased demand for training in the early stages of the current crisis as senior managers reassured themselves that they and their organization were match fit for the road ahead so initially yeah. they wanted to know where they were but um, thereafter, I guess it fell away a bit um, for them. Um, anything more you want to add on 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 that topic? Uh, yeah, Johnson? just just briefly. I think yeah. what is really important, and I am saying this not just for self-interest, but again because I passionately believe it. It is vital that certainly come 2021, training and exercising programs resume in full. I am again concerned about particularly um, senior leaders potentially believing that if they have endured and you know managed to get through covid that that is their crisis management rehearsal done and that that means that they will be able to navigate through any future crisis again covid has a number of unique characteristics which are not present in other situations for example covid affected every business and so you were masked by everybody else dealing with the same crisis at the same time a conventional crisis you are in the spotlight alone covid was a slow burn crisis and continues to be often a traditional crisis is about a big event that happens on a particular day so the experience and learnings yeah. of covid whilst they are valuable they are valuable they are not completely and utterly transferable to all crisis situations. So yeah, that's really, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So really you know, it's not not good for a terror attack or something like that, correct. or so, you know, like an instant crisis. Correct. Yeah, yes. this is this is slow burn, rising tide kind of crisis. Yeah. I mean, here's a question for you, and this is something those of us who do these kind of things, as you do, Jonathan, um, crisis simulations. Mm -hmm. Should the default be now that you do remote crisis simulations? I know they're hard to do because I've tried, I've done them, um, but you know, with we've we've established 80. 
percent more of people on this call today are working from home so uh, you know surely remote simulations are the way to go do you have a thought on that please i do and we have one uh one very well known organization which is a client that is currently uh delaying uh doing an exercise that they want to do until in their own words everyone is back in the office mm. and for me it's a, a little bit like in a crisis you know when people wait for that decision and they keep waiting and they keep delaying because they want one more piece of information or they want one more, one more thing to happen and as a consequence they make that decision far too late so that's a circuitous way of saying i think right now and at least for the next six months I suspect it absolutely will make sense for exercising to be virtual. If we do get back to a situation whereby, let's say 50% plus of people are back in the office, then we can change course again. But yeah, exercise for the reality, and the reality right now is people are working. From okay, home. but I think a lot. I think a lot of our guests are going to be thinking, "Crikey, this is difficult." Have you got any tips for remote exercising? I've done them, so I, I'm aware of how difficult it is to engage people in a remote exercise. Do you have any particular tips on, uh, you know, how to run a successful remote crisis simulation? I, I'm putting you on the spot there, but any thoughts on that, please? Well, again, as you will know, Jim, and as everyone on again on the call will know, a successful exercise depends on really thorough really robust planning that makes for a very realistic experience so in the same way that one would engage in that very very thorough planning for a physical exercise and that you would endeavor to make it as realistic as possible you do the same for a virtual exercise now is it as I guess it is. It, it, I guess what I'm really saying is it's the real world. Is it as yeah. pleasurable having a virtual meeting with a friend as it is meeting them face to face? No. Is it quite no. as engaging? No. But is that the reality of how we are going to manage crisis going forward? Yes. So therefore, I guess what I'm really saying is it can absolutely, we can replicate or certainly mirror how it would really be to manage a crisis in a virtual setting what that means is it's not going to be quite so visceral and engaging as it would have been doing it face to face but that is the reality not sure if I've answered your, your question I think I'm probably saying yes uh, it is going to be a little yeah. bit more challenging there may be more glitches it may be a little bit less engaging but that is an experience of what real life would be like and that is the purpose of an exercise to rehearse real life indeed it is i just had a nice apropos really of nothing in particular i had a quite a nice thing um, a quote the other day evacuations may happen at the last minute but successful evacuation strategies are months or years in the planning. So like yeah, it. Planning, is the, planning is the way to go. I don't know where I picked that from, but I just hmm. got it. Now we've got a few things. People are saying things to me here. Um, Mohammed is saying, oh, well, yes, leadership is the biggest challenge we are facing. What can we do with regard to that? Well, leadership in a, uh, wow. yeah, it's a big question, isn't it? Leadership in a crisis is absolutely crucial. Um, and give us, a, I actually posted something on this on LinkedIn recently, but um, any thoughts on leadership in a crisis um, from you, Jonathan, please? I mean, we could certainly. Um do a half day if not a full day conference on uh, on that but i yeah i guess yeah. i guess all i would do is 110 percent endorse that it begins with leadership and it begins with leadership before the event is the is the leadership team and is the ceo in particular uh championing and helping to create a crisis resistant culture is the leadership team endorsing and participating in the crisis management training and exercising that you have laid on and are they stepping forward when the crisis happens and being courageous in making those really tough decisions um, so absolutely leadership is you know fundamental to successful yeah. crisis planning and I mean, crisis if, handling 
Yeah, indeed. And if I could just add a couple of things there, I was trying desperately to remember what I posted the other day, but I think one of them was that it's not necessarily leaders taking the wrong decisions that is a bad thing. It's taking no decisions at all, yeah. become yeah. like caught a rabbit in the headlights. Sometimes Absolutely. it's called an analysis paralysis where they yes. constantly want more and more yeah. information, but they yeah. still can't take a decision. So what, yeah. what we tend to train is that you need to take decision points du during a yes. day where you have to take a decision and the other thing from a sort of comms point of view is that amongst staff um, panic is quite often yeah becomes a problem amongst staff and that yes. usually is the result of conflicting messages from those in authority so it's conflicting you know you need to have yeah. clear consistent messages internally yeah. and obviously you need to have clear and consistent external messages at all and Jonathan and go ahead I, the, I think you're bursting to say something there. Uh, yeah sorry and um, one of the things that was very clear in COVID is that our people employees were probably for most organizations the most important stakeholder group and I think in a situation like this your people will be asking of their leaders fundamentally two questions are they competent to lead us through this extraordinarily challenging situation and do they really care about us and I think if leaders in a crisis can tick off both of those boxes particularly with their people then they will retain the trust, loyalty and support of those people. Yes, you know, we have the skills and the leadership ability to guide you through this and to resolve this enormous problem. But we've also demonstrated not just by what we've said, but also by what we've done that we care about our people. And I think they're two really key criteria for leaders to think about when they're operating in a crisis. I think you might be muted, Jim. I'm not sure if it's just me. I am. But I'm not... I am. I'm, I'm technically <laughs> dreadful. Honestly, I've been running these things for so long. I'm still doing this. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, uh, for making me look like a fool. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mute um, you. <laughs> no, I just did it myself. Yeah, I, you know, I just did it myself. Um, what is your advice for incident management training scenarios? Scenarios for 2020 done virtually. I guess it depends on the organisation. But what? Uh, any other scenarios you look to be doing there, Jonathan? I mean, I, I I would again concur with 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 you, Jim. I think the critical thing with a scenario is that it is absolutely relevant and tailored to your organisation. So I would look at, you know, your critical risks and pick one from your top five or or top ten uh, risks. I think what I also look for from scenarios is one which presents a multiplicity of challenges. I get a bit concerned when it's one dimensional for for example a physical incident like let's say an office fire um, it needs to have multiple layers and multiple elements to provide a challenge not just for the operational response but also the reputational response but I, I would very much look at your own risk landscape um, and and choose a scenario accordingly a risk assessment to yeah see what see what uh, the problems are got a couple of other things here any tips on staying top of the mind for the board senior management when if normality returns and everything goes back to business as usual i suppose that's where everybody breathes a huge sigh of relief that it's all over but I, i'm not sure that's going to happen anytime soon so maybe we don't need to worry about that um okay um let's see what have we got um okay uh, okay here's a question from mohammed mm -hmm. the relationship between business continuity plans a classic this one um the relationship between business continuity plans and crisis management plans mm -hmm. are they all do they always come together or can they be active i mean we are there they are different things jonathan right yes do, do you, maybe for people who don't know do you just want to scope that out a little bit please yes and my starting point would be to say ultimately whatever you call something the most important thing is that everybody who is involved in response to a crisis or a business continuity issue needs to understand the architecture and purpose of the documents that you are using so the most important thing is for there to be clarity within your organization as to what if there are multiple plans 
what their purpose is. The second important thing is to make absolutely certain, and this sadly isn't always the case, that the various plans that you have, emergency response plans, business continuity plans, crisis plans, crisis communication plans, that they talk to each other. They are genuinely integrated and they certainly don't conflict with each other because if you've got a business continuity plan saying this needs to happen, and the crisis management plan saying something else needs to happen, then you have a recipe for disaster. My, my definition of a crisis management plan would be it is the, the plan which guides the strategic response to a major incident. And within that plan, you would have a definition of what for you a major incident or crisis is. The crisis management plan would typically be used by the senior leadership team and also in you know, gold, silver, uh, parlance it may well also be used by silver you might have a gold level crisis management plan at head office and a silver level crisis management plan in the regions or in the business divisions and for me its role is particularly to guide that immediate strategic response particularly in the first two or three days of the crisis and once it's done that almost its job is done because you will then be into a, a rhythm the business continuity plan is, as again, the people on this call will understand, focused on ensuring that to the best extent possible, the business is able to continue operating both during the period of crisis and then increasingly so beyond the, uh, the period of crisis. So your business continuity plan would often uh, be live and kind of active, in my experience, for maybe longer than your crisis management plan is being uh, is being actively applied. So often operating in parallel, the key thing is that they're integrated and the even more key thing is that there is no confusion within the business about where those plans fit in and what their roles are. Yeah, good. I mean, I don't, maybe I'm adding to confusion, I don't know, but I'm quite a fan of playbooks as well, like uh, particularly of cyber playbooks, where you have a particular checklist, you have yep. all your contacts for cyber, yep. you know, because the cyber fighting a cyber crisis is quite different in some respects to fighting other crises, and particularly so now, as we've already talked about with people working from home. So I quite like play. Do you ever use playbooks at all, Jonathan? Is this something you do? Yes. Or, or do you not so, like them? Um, no, I do. Um, I do. So uh, my view on this is that for all crises, again, there are frameworks, structures, principles, processes and ways of working that should apply to all crises. And then either separately or maybe as part of an appendix within the plan, you have scenario by scenario playbooks which are specific to certain scenarios. My only concern is that on occasions, I have seen organizations do just the latter, so playbooks for critical risks, but with no overarching principles, processes, or ways of working in addition to those, which as I say, leaves you open to being really well geared up if one of your top 10 scenarios occurs, but being absolutely stymied if number 11 on your risk or number 127 on your list that never had a playbook developed occurs. So I like to have both. I like to have a plan which includes principles, ways of working in any crisis, plus playbooks for particular scenarios. Okay, that sounds great. Well, guys, you know where to go if you need a, need help with that. Now, a really, really interesting question from Rico here, which maybe is a, it's a great question, but maybe a little bit outside our expertise. But it's this, Jonathan. Is there an appetite for training in addressing employee welfare during a crisis. Now that you see employee welfare during COVID is, is you know, we know that so I, I've been t talking with a, a psychologist that I know that people, some people are really struggling with working yeah. from home. We're, we're sort of moving slightly outside of our territory, but I'm aware that there are mental health issues here and that companies need to be, to 
to respond to that and to, to think about that and to help people through that. Now, whether there is any appetite for training on that, um, it's probably outside our expertise, Jonathan, but it's certainly something that you, I can see by, by your response that it's something you've thought about. Yeah, there are a couple of things I'd say on that. You're right that it's not part of my or yeah. our core expertise. However, yeah. there is a requirement and an appetite for that. Whether it's training or support, there is definitely an appetite and requirement for it. The thing that I would say, which maybe is where this question and the kind of topic of crisis management maybe overlaps is, I think there is a particular need for the people on this call to consider the mental health and how people within the crisis management and business continuity teams themselves are feeling at the moment because those are people who've been working flat out for the last however many months it is six months or more you know there are the people who've been furloughed um, who are worried about their jobs but they haven't been working flat out but many of the people in fact all of the people on this call would have been working relentlessly and what we're hearing from clients is there is if nothing else huge fatigue um, and there is also amongst a number of people quite understandably uh, a feeling of trepidation as they look to the future and feel like they're going to have to continue this for the next 3, 6, 12, 18, 24 months it was all fine getting by on on adrenaline for the first two or three months to go yes, okay yeah. here we go again is really tough so a general yes there's an appetite for it but don't forget to look after yourselves and look after your teams as well because you are in the very front line of that danger zone of, of mental health because of the pressures you've all been working under. Yeah, that's that's great. And wise words. I, I have a, an old friend of mine who's head of business continuity at uh, Marks and Spencer, and I know it's uh, oof, it's a, it's been a tough gig uh, over the last few months. I know that. So yeah, look after yourself. I think that's that's really really and good do, words. Uh, do do yeah, go take on, go ahead. Do, do take a breath and do sit down with your colleagues in business continuity or crisis management and be open about well firstly I think it's really important to within that discussion recognize the success that you've achieved against extraordinary odds you will have achieved yeah. some amazing things so don't move on before saying hang on guys look at what we did but then I think it's really helpful to share how we all feeling now you know what are our hopes and fears for the for the next for the coming period so uh, I would encourage you to have um, you know open but structured conversations with your colleagues to get those things out on the table. We know that in any form of stress or anxiety, it's better when these things are discussed than when they're kept bottled up. So uh, now I think, you know, as we're getting back somewhere towards full speed uh, in business, now is a really good time to do that. Excellent. We've got quite a few things come in that I'd like to share with you, Jonathan. Yeah. Oh, just first, very quickly, Sharon is asking whether this um, uh, webinar will be available to download well it will certainly be on uh, the BCI uh, website it will be on it will it will be available is the answer uh, after this apparently Sam was suffering a bit there with um, bad internet connections so that's all right now quite interesting from Susan Susan says we have talking about mental health issues we have specialists that do online sessions for staff to help them with mental health issues and those struggling with working from home we also have a service provider who they can call to talk to it's very important but not always sufficient as everyone wants to use it and attend so that's someone who mm -hmm. is looking into that um, and Steve is saying in the last few months has certainly been a recognition of the mental health issues from senior management however the response from the welfare professionals within the organization we well, thinks has been slightly lacking a better response has been from colleagues who know and understand the pressures we've all been working under a sort of oh, this is interesting a mutual support group type yeah. mentality has developed in our team uh, despite remote working that, that, that's an interesting one Jonathan right absolutely yeah, yeah. okay um, okay okay that's good um, 
Okay, here's one. Uh, this is from Mercy. Uh, what are your thoughts on operational resilience, breaking down silos between business continuity and risk management? We've kind of talked about that. Well, I'm, a, I'm against people working in silos at all. And of course, one of the problems with home working is it is forcing us to work in silos. And that's one aspect I can't stand about home working. Yeah. I can't just lean over your computer, mm -hmm. Jonathan, and say, look, oh, actually, you know what, that looks great. But what about if you did this or you say to me, Jim, come on, that's not right. This is yeah. how, you know, that all that kind of interaction, which is just, you know, yeah. something that we would do in an office yeah. is, is now much, much more difficult to do, I think. Absolutely. And again, I'm just going to endorse what you said and what Mercy okay. is, is, right. is, is suggesting in that, like we talked about, you know, the plans having to work together, the people have to work together. Anybody that has a stake in business continuity or crisis management need to have good open relationships with each other because when the event happens those people need to be working together in the most collaborative effective way possible so you know joint scenario planning joint exercising simply building up relationships yeah absolutely critical okay great stuff um let's let's just move on unfortunately goodness we're almost there we've only got five minutes left um let's just move on a little bit i mean i mean we've sort of been talking yeah. about this a little bit but do you think that people have taken um so oh no i've got no, no, my i'm ruining the technology again um <laughs> do you think that people have taken their eye off the ball a bit as far as terror and cyber goes or, or do you think on the still on the whole on the whole yes as I, I mentioned earlier we are doing cyber exercises um yeah but i'm i'm i am worried so the word worry there is is right um okay you know, that there those risks still exist i would suggest they are even uh more likely now than before and you know I think they need to be planned for, trained for, rehearsed for, and I think vigilance needs to be needs to be higher than ever. Absolutely. Okay, that's perfect. All right, just the last thing. Just want to do a little case study before we mm -hmm. go with 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 Jonathan. Uh, I guess quite a few of you will have noticed this. You know, Garmin, the uh, fancy uh, fitness watch company, they recently suffered a cyber attack, and I I learned about this quite early because a friend of mine, one of my colleagues at Udo, had bought himself a pricey Garmin watch to log his runs and his PBs and so forth, and he was less than impressed when a few days later. Um, he got a message from Garmin saying that the system was down for maintenance, <laughs> uh, but it quickly proved a way bigger problem than that as it emerged that, that Garmin was subject to a ransomware attack. The firm tried to keep the story under wraps. Well, good luck with that in the days of social media. So uh, Twitter sort of opened up on them with both barrels. They tried to play it down for a week. They finally released a statement saying, we're working to resolve the issue as quickly as possible and apologize for this inconvenience. Now, I raise this simply because at the time, I know, Jonathan, you were quite critical mm -hmm. of their response. Yeah. So with your sort of crisis comms hat on, yeah. what did they do wrong and how yeah. should they have responded? And I will uh, reveal a personal interest in this. Oh. There is my ah. uh, Garmin uh, watch. Um, oh. Right. So <laughs> <laughs> they they contravened, uh, you know, the well-established uh, best practice of crisis communication. They were too slow to respond. The story had got away from them before they responded. They were, let's use the word, disingenuous in what they did say. The words, as you described, Jim, were, you know, we are down for maintenance. That was yes. only very broadly uh, uh, true. true. Uh, <laughs> and and yeah. their communication when it came was without empathy or contrition. Uh, what what should they have done? The, and it, you know, I'm stuttering over my words now because it still kind of staggers me 30 years on that organizations don't do the basics well what they should have done was they should have assessed their biggest risks so if you are you know a sports watch manufacturer where people log their times online data, via an data, app is, and data, data is pretty important <laughs> what is what is one of your biggest risks yeah. what what is likely to happen and what would have a negative impact on you so did they not do that risk assessment if they did why did they not plan 
their response to that incident because it felt like they were making it up as they were going along. They could have scenario planned, they could have they could have determined what their strategic intent would be, they could have defined their messages, they could have drafted up template tweets, template statements, they clearly hadn't done that. And then in the execution, it needed to be swift, frequent, expansive, regular, open, honest, and transparent. Nobody is you know, surprised or hugely critical if an organization suffers a cyber attack. It happens to everyone. As with any crisis, it's about how you respond to it that people judge you on, not so much the fact of the um, attack itself. And I think the other, the final interesting thing about this situation is when you are managing a crisis or communicating in a crisis, you need to be cognizant of the broader context in which this crisis is happening. Actually, and again, I speak personally, during the pandemic, the focus on exercise um, was bigger than normal. And, you know, the desire to know how many steps or how long it took me to run a certain distance was more important than it would be normally, because it was the one thing that I could still do that I did in normal life. And so there, they didn't seem to get the fact that this was even more um, damaging and worrying and harmful yeah, to their users yeah, yeah. right now than normally. So as well as all the other good crisis communication practice that they contravened, I'd also encourage people to be aware of the context in which they are uh, dealing exactly. with a particular crisis. So there was no kind of empathy for the context in which it was taking no. place. Really, really good point. All right, Jonathan, I'm afraid we're, we're, our time is up. Could just very, very quickly, could we just sort of summarize the takeaways from our talk now? What are the big crisis management changes likely over the next few years? I know that's a gigantic question to finish up in 30 seconds, but what are the big takeaways from today's talk? So for me, uh, first big change is that crisis management planning needs to become part of business as usual. And my hope is that this will be the wake up call that makes it part of business as usual. The second one is that it should move nearer to the center of the organization. By that, I mean there is a danger of crisis management and business continuity being some kind of niche or kind of exotic or very specialist area. I think what we've experienced recently means that in future it needs to be nearer the centre. And the third thing is, I think what we've experienced over the last um, six months shows that crisis management needs to be viewed as something of strategic significance, which can prevent significant long-term damage to an organisation. So part of business as usual, more core to the activity of, of, of the business and seen as a strategic discipline. Okay, Jonathan. Well, that, that's fantastic. And thank you so much for that. Um, that now brings us to the end of this webinar, which hopefully has sparked some thoughts and ideas, and hopefully you found it useful. Um, we've had lots of questions, which would indicate that people have. Just want to thank you very much, Jonathan, for that. Fantastic You're guest. Welcome. I've enjoyed you. it. Good, good man, good man. Um, our next webinar will be in October and that will feature actually a crisis simulation, a remote crisis simulation. So watch out for that. But in the meantime, thanks very much for listening. Thank you so much and goodbye.